All right, looks like we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. What are we focusing on today in this video? We are dealing with, we are refuting the keyboard Karens of the world. We are refuting the keyboard ninjas. And it is going to be a ton of fun. And we are going to uh, do this a little more frequently because, as I pointed out, it is a ton of fun. And a lot of these comments that we get in the comment section of our videos are just too priceless, are, are too funny to not manifest to the world to show you guys what we are dealing with in terms of the full time, the full time comment warriors, keyboard warriors that we have on the channel. We love them. And that's why we keep them around because they really are a lot of fun. And they do say that laughter is the best medicine. So real quick, couple a uh, couple reminders. We are doing a new podcast series. We're keeping the videos roughly 30 to 40 minutes long. We've done two episodes thus far, and we're really, really going to be pumping out the content, guys. Because as you know, over the last month, I've been working uh, anywhere between 8 and 10 hours a day. Uh, completing the endogenous retrovirus handbook, dismantling the best evidence for common ancestry. And guys, this is the most comprehensive response to endogenous retroviruses as evidence for common descent that you'll ever find. I've got novel predictions, novel arguments in there. The critics will fail and the challenge is out there. Okay, the book will be released on June 1st. We're in the final stages of publishing and uh, the critics will dodge. The critics will duck, dive, dip, dodge all over the place. Okay, the five D's of dodgeball and I'm excited. So the first episode we dealt with recombination rates and um, the critics argument that suggests that uh, the rates of recombination would have to be far too fast for biblical creation to be true. Dealt with that in episode one. Uh, yesterday, we put out episode two, myself and Professor David McQueen. And Professor David McQueen gave a presentation on copper creation and the worldwide flood. So please check those out. Share those around. Of course, the truth is important. We got some fantastic debates coming up for you. This is just a snapshot as I do want to keep these comments on comments uh, relatively shorter as well for you. And uh, so again, this is just a snapshot here of the upcoming events that we do have. So make sure you are subscribed. If you're not yet subscribed, we are close to hitting 10,000 subscribers. And so with your help, uh, we can hopefully hit that sooner than later. If you want to be a Standing for Truth financial backer, we'd love to have your help as we are doing this full time, putting out full time content and uh, making sure it is the most up to date, the best content available. So you can do that through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. You can receive access to all sorts of uh exclusive Patreon material, as well as uh, through our website, sameforthruthministries.com, which we have endless content. Uh, we just had a, a recent update there, so uh, you can help support us there as well. Anyways, uh, tonight, the Evolution Debate Challenge series continues. Is there reasonable evidence for evolution? This is a much anticipated debate. That is for sure. Uh, Ian Chen and Dr. Dino are going to battle it out and I think this is like the first of about five of these uh, debates now yeah, over the next few weeks. So we are going to be busy and it feels good that um, the ERV book is done because now I can really start uh, focusing on, um, you know, a lot more of, of these shows and, and certainly these live streams. If only evolution were true, you know, I could be hit with a, with a, a gene duplication and there'd be two of me to go around. So we'd be pumping out double the amount of content. Anyways, on the night, this debate's coming up. This one is going to be huge. I would say this is probably going to be one of the biggest uh, debates on soteriology in a while. Uh, Robert Wilkin and Robert Sanjanis, they are going to be debating the question of salvation. Does the Bible teach salvation by faith alone or salvation by faith plus works? Okay, so that being said, just make sure you're up to date on uh, everything going on on this channel. Make sure you're subscribed, hit that like button, hit that notification bell, because we have a lot going on for the rest of the year. 
So that being said, let's let's kind of get right into it. Let's share a screen here and let's have let's have some fun. OK, let's uh, where are we going to start? Let's start right here. Um, good old Sam Burns. What would we do without him? You know, why do we keep him around? Um, because they give us a good laugh and laughter is the best medicine. And uh, for, for shows like this, comments on comments, refuting the keyboard cares of the world. Um, it's why they hide out in the in the comment section because they know they they won't stand a chance repeating the same already debunked talking points uh, in the octagon, which we know is the uh, debate stage. And in comment sections, you can dodge, you can duck, you can dip, you can dive, you can dodge all over the place. But but in a debate, if you're dodging, you're going to get called out on it. If you're tap dancing, you're going to get called out on it. And Sam Birds would most definitely <laughs> get called out on it. So this was for the video um, yesterday, refuting the critics on recombination rate. So 132 comments later. And... Get a drink of water. Your throat's a little dry today. So, um, 132 comments later, and no, no sophisticated rebuttal to what I presented. And apparently, you know, this is their just number one argument <clears throat> against created heterozygosity. And yet, what? Nothing of sophistication. No real counter response. Okay, we have Sam Burns who's skipping right to the 18 minute mark going after what he believes he can address, which he can. He failed miserably. Um, your car. So this is what he says. Let's kind of cover this a little bit, okay? This is getting into genetic entropy a little bit. Your car slash mutation analogy, he says, makes the same mistake all creationists do. You forgot about the effects of selection. Isn't it so funny how they just kind of assert that creationists are ignoring uh, natural selection, even though we, we very much... Uh, talk about we very frequently talk about natural selection we'll get into that a little bit later let's finish this comment you forgot about the effects of selection on propagating mutations you also forgot to mention a mutation can only be judged deleterious neutral or beneficial uh, within its its local uh environment suppose you had a mutation in the fuel injector of your car which pro which provided less fuel equals less power to the engine in an environment where cars are raced this would be deleterious. However, in an environment where fuel economy is critical, like now, burning less fuel would be highly beneficial. And of course, you know, I decided to just kind of respond to him, just just to prove to the world that he's going to dodge whatever I say. So um, I don't want to bore you guys with my long response. So kind of uh, in a nutshell, I'll, I'll break this down. And um, what he is not understanding is the fact that natural selection exists. Okay, mutations exist. Mutations happen. And uh, the problem for Sam Burns here, though, is the fact that selection has to do with, with reproduction, okay? It has to do differential reproduction, and it has to do with the death of individuals. Selection is only going to see the worst, most detrimental mutations, okay? That zebra that's born with, a, with a, you know, only three legs in, instead of four, Okay, that zebra is not going to run very, very far. It's going to get eaten and it's going to be removed from the occasion. You know, that's a, a large enough mutation <laughs> to uh, be noticeable by uh, natural selection. And selection may be even be able to manifest, or I should say amplify the best beneficial mutations. Okay, but what's funny, and as, as the Lenski experiment uh, demonstrated, your, your beneficial mutations, are, are very rare, roughly one in a million, okay? So your, your beneficial mutations are roughly one in a million. And even when those beneficial mutations pop up, they are reductive. I mean, take any example, unless you're dealing with something that's epigenetic where you've just had a switch being turned on, you know, you have an adaptive episode based on the pre-existing ability or pre-existing capacity for that adaptation. Most of these uh, so-called beneficial mutations are at the expense of functional systems, the breaking down of functional systems, okay? Um, if you look to sickle cell anemia, it's the result of a broken gene, broken protein, a, a broken red blood cell, essentially the, the destruction of pre-existing information for a, a very narrow increase, and I guess you could say fitness. If I were born without my arms and let's say I was born without my hands or feet. 
let's just say we, we had a mutation like that. That's not necessarily going to prevent me from having kids and passing on my genes. Okay, that's why fitness can be a little bit deceiving, especially if you have somebody like Lensky, the way that he's defining fitness versus when we actually measure the to total functionality of, let's say, his bacterial populations. His bacterial populations have shrank in functional genome size. They've adapted short-term by losing genes. What that is, is it's long-term degeneration. Okay, if you have um, millions of nucleotide sites, you have countless nucleotide sites being eroded due to low-impact deleterious mutation accumulation that are these uh, mutations are effectively neutral. That's what population geneticists uh, refer to them as. And if these deleterious mutations are eroding countless uh, nucleotide sites. Well, here's the thing, waiting for one single beneficial point mutation is not gonna counterbalance all of the damage being done in other parts of the genome, okay? All that these you know, so-called beneficial mutations will do or a trade-off would do is result in shrinking functional genome sizes. So no, we don't ignore selection. We just understand the fact that selection is very limited. Okay, you can't select away an entire population. That's immediate extinction. All right, and selection cannot see these low impact mutations. And he does give a very common rescue device that we will deal with here very shortly. Okay, and um, so here he said, you also forgot to mention a mutation can be judged deleterious, neutral, or beneficial. Um, and, and I pointed out that no, uh, most mutations are deleterious. Most mutations are effectively neutral. Okay. The selection can't see them. And the problem is that every single human being on this planet is multiply mutant. Okay. We've all accumulated roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. Okay. If you want to source for that, here we go. Uh, it, it's, it's widely understood. Mutation and human exceptionalism, our future genetic load. Michael Lynch, certainly not a young earth creationist. An average newborn contains 100 de novo mutations, okay? So every single human being is multiply mutant, some more mutant than others, but nonetheless, every single human being on this planet has accumulated 100 more mutations than their parents, 200 more mutations than their grandparents. Now, the problem is this. They want to say, well, mutations will build up, right, that are unselectable, that are slightly deleterious, but they'll build up to a point where they're, they, they do uh, in, um, when you consider all of them, they, they amplify deleterious effects to the point where now selection can, can see these, these mutants and remove them from the e equation. What the evolutionist is not understanding is for one, the, the, all these mechanisms have been uh, falsified. That is essentially the mutation count mechanism. By the time the human population accumulates enough mutations for selection to see, every single human being on the planet is mutant. So selection would have to remove the entire uh, human species, essentially. And, and that's not going to be the case. Okay, selection is limited. Let's do this. This is what destroys, like, for example, Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, the dodgeball man himself. And he's very proud of that Golden Dodgeball Award, and he should be. He should be. Uh, Dr. Joel Duff, he's he's in the running this year, 2022, for that Golden Dodgeball Award. He's working hard for it. He's working hard for it. And um, it's going to be close, though. It's going to be close. So maybe we should set up a debate, Dodgeball Dan versus Dr. Joel Duff. And the uh, it can be a formal debate, of course, uh, so it doesn't get overly heated. And, and I can moderate it. And the uh, the question or the thesis for the debate can be, you know, who deserves the 2022 Golden Dodgeball Award the most? Um, that'll be quite the battle. So the point is, let's say we've got seven to eight billion people on the planet. Okay, let's give them a benefit of the doubt. Dodgeball Dan likes to say, you know, it's about relative fitness. And I've done full videos exposing uh, articles and chapters and books. I'm not going to spend too much time on this argument specifically. But for sake of argument, let's say, okay, let's remove half the population. Let's say we, we remove 4 billion people from the equation, the most mutants, the most mutant people on this planet. Let, let's remove them. Well, here's the thing. We're now left with 4 billion people that are more mutant than the generation before it. Okay. 4 billion people who have accumulated over 100 new mutations per person per generation than the generation before it. 
So now you're left with 4 billion people who are still multiply mutant. So even for sake of argument, even giving them the benefit of the doubt, giving them the world, it doesn't work. Okay, selection's limited. That, that wouldn't even happen. But the thing is, all selection can ever do is slow down the process. And it's all been systematically analyzed through Mendel's accountant. Okay, they've even assumed in their uh, numerical simulations that the majority of the genome is junk when we actually know that there's evidence that the, the majority of the genome is functional. Okay, and I cover this in great detail in the upcoming book on endogenous retroviruses, but even if the genome were only 10% functional, these numerical simulations that are based on realistic parameters um, shows that genomes and, and species still still degenerate. And this is just a fatal blow to evolutionary theory because if species cannot persist for millions of years into the past, species could not have persisted for millions of years uh, into the future. They can't persist for millions of years into the future. They could not have persisted for millions of years into the past would be the, the best way to understand it. So I do want to go over this, this slide over here because this is important, okay? The human mutation rate is roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. The eight mutation rate is similar. Almost none of these mutations are beneficial. Remember, when they do happen, that one rare beneficial mutation, they're generally still uh, reductive. I'm going to go back to his comment here because it's funny what he said here about his kind of analogy with the car. It's actually more like Okay, Mr. Sam, it's more like if your car, you're driving down the street and your car engine were to just jump in, in, into the back seat while you're driving. Okay, you know what? You're done. The car's done. Sure. Uh, that, that's big enough <laughs> to be noticed. But what we see in terms of the biological world and uh, low impact, merely neutral deleterious mutation accumulation is <clears throat> more similar to rust on a car or a single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia. <clears throat> and that compared to the, these major deleterious mutations that pop up, I mean, a single point mutation can kill, can kill somebody and that person will then not be reproducing and passing on their genes and having kids, okay? And um, you can service your car as much as you want. You can take it in all the time, regular oil changes, change the tires, change the windshield wipers, really, really take care of your car. Okay. But that's never going to stop the eventual rusting out of your car, the eventual, de eventual degeneration of your car. And the problem is um, we accumulate uh, mutations in our uh, somatic cells all the time. Okay. We um die primarily due to mutation accumulation so we die from mutations as in we have genetic entropy on a personal level but we also have genetic entropy on a population level because many of these mutations are passed on and since most of them are unselectable and invisible to selection what they are subject to is genetic drift and so they spread so mutation count mechanism doesn't work synergistic epistasis doesn't work that actually speeds up the degeneration process Okay, because remember, every single human being on this planet, planet is multiply mutant. And there's no type of selection, and Sam Burns was incapable of um, addressing my comment. And he was incapable of, of providing a type of selection that can remove so many, that can essentially remove the unselectables, right? And I pointed out, you ignored my entire response. And so he, he pointed out here, and this is kind of what we're, we're debunking here, and we'll, we'll move on. You forgot that when enough nearly neutral mutations, so he's trying to say, okay, so let, let's take the human population. So enough of these effectively neutral mutations, they build up, okay? Or slightly deleterious. Accumulate in an individual to become visible, okay? So he's trying to say at first they're unselectable, but they accumulate in the species enough over enough periods of time where now they become noticed because that species has uh, essentially devolved into such significant genetic, genetic sickness that selection can now see. And therefore, as you see here, will be removed <laughs> when that individual is selected out. Notice this, when that individual is selected out. So he says there isn't any problem. Humans and other species aren't going extinct because of them. Nice assertion. Uh, and this is funny. There isn't, 
There also isn't any uh, evidence most mutations are deleterious. I'll, as I always do, and I've been doing for the last three to four years, I'll show a number of uh, citations from uh, evolutionist population geneticists that uh, do agree that yes, um, all mutations must have some effect on fitness, even if that effect is vanishingly small. They all must be uh, deleterious, but most of them being slightly deleterious, which makes them unselectable. And so he just doesn't get it. By the time selection apparently is able to see the population that has accumulated enough low impact, nearly neutral deleterious mutations, um, where they have descended into enough genetic sickness for selection to see, the entire population has been subjected to these mutations. So again, selection is limited. Sam, it doesn't work. And this has been invalidated and falsified through hundreds, maybe thousands of numerical simulations. Okay, and yes, it, it, there consists of uh, overwhelming evidence that the majority of the genome is functional. And um, we, could, we could touch on that for hours. For sake of time, I won't. And that makes the problem even worse. But even for sake of argument, if we were to just say, sure, the genome is only 10% functional, which is ridiculous. That's not even feasible. It's still too much. <laughs> That's still 10 deleterious mutations per person per generation that, that are accumulating. So he's trying to say, eventually, in the human population, apparently, where every human is multiply mutant, eventually you'll get to a point where I guess selection is just going to remove every single human being, which is going to uh, result in immediate extinction. I mean, nice solution there, uh, Sam. So the new ENCODE findings reveal that most of the human genome is functional, hence most random changes in the genome must be deleterious. Even if, here we go, even if 90% of the genome is perfectly neutral junk DNA, which is no longer feasible, very true, there would still be about 10 harmful mutations arising in every person, every generation. Even the most fit, notice this, even the most fit individuals on this planet, because remember, it's about the fact that every generation is just a little bit more mutant than the generation before it. So yes, there will always be some that are more mutant. There will always be some that are born with unfortunately a, a mutation or a defect that is large enough that that individual will unfortunately not be able to uh, reproduce. It's the sad reality of genetic entropy. But even the most fit individuals are still more mutant than their parents. Take a different analogy. Take a room full of 100 people. And if you could tell which of those 100 people were the most mutant and you remove them from the equation, let's say 50% of the 100 people, you're left with 50 people who are what? Still mutant. Still more mutant than the generation before it. Selection's incredibly limited. Too many mutations are pouring in. Most of these mutations, selection cannot even see. And even your one rare beneficial mutation turns out to be reductive. Reductive. Functionally compromising to the organism as a whole. And this is why when they look to this argument from environmental context, they're not considering the total func functionality of the genome. They're not considering total fitness. Where it's 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 akin to this. It's analogous to this. I, I like to use this uh, analogy for people. Let's say temporarily you wanted to get better gas mileage in your car. Okay, so you decided to remove weight, remove the doors, remove the back seats, remove the side mirrors, whatever you can do to temporarily reduce the weight of the car so you can temporarily improve gas mileage. Well, you're destroying the car. You're removing uh, important components from the car where, sure, temporarily you have better gas mileage, but overall the car is not improving. You're actually destroying it. And that's exactly what we see in terms of a lot of these mutations. This is what we see in Lenski's experiment is we have an increase in fitness in a very narrow sense. But overall, when you consider total functionality, you have a decrease. That's why the question comes down to a net gain versus a net loss of total genetic functionality. And there is never going to be a way to counterbalance the influx of low impact, nearly neutral, deleterious mutations that are pouring into the genomes of living organisms generation 
after generation, there is no way synergistic epistasis doesn't work, truncation selection doesn't work, mutation count mechanism doesn't work, back mutations don't work, this so-called idea of an equilibrium does not work. It's all been addressed. They've all been falsified. Okay, evolution, it's, it's time to tap out, but we understand that the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3 that there will be those who are willingly ignorant, and therefore they have to deny the reality of genetic degeneration. So even intense selection, this is what I was pointing out earlier, unrealistic amounts of selection remove 50% of the worst. Well, guess what? That still will not stop mutation accumulation. We've got the math on this. Thousands of simulation experiments have refuted all of these rescue devices. <clears throat> because most deleterious mutations cannot be selected away, they will accumulate continuously from one generation to the next. They will spread due to genetic drift. Okay, here we go. Why genetic entropy is a problem for evolution? Sam Burns, come on, address it. Why can't natural selection filter out all the bad mutations? Two main reasons. There are too many bad mutations continuously pouring into the population. And B, most bad mutations are too subtle to be selectively removed. As a matter of fact, most beneficial mutations never reach fixation. They're eventually lost because there's so much noise in the genome to begin with. Okay, epigenetic mutations will consistently magnify this problem. And, um, you know, we, I could do an entire four hour, five hour presentation on genetic entropy. So for sake of time, I won't. Um, but Dr. John Sanford, he's spoken at, at the NIH. I wonder if Sam Burns has. <laughs> and he demonstrated that uh, these rescue mechanisms, artificially contrived rescue mechanisms, like mutation count mechanisms, synergistic epistasis, they've been looked at, they've been analyzed, and they've been systematically demolished. Just like Sam Burns and the uh, fellow keyboard Karens are being demolished today in this video. Slightly deleterious mutations. Kimora. Well, Mr. Sam Burns, he's not exactly, uh, Kimora is not exactly a young earth creationist. Under the present model, effectively neutral. Here we go. Effectively standing for truth. You're just making, uh, you know, this up. I was debating, uh, what's his name? Um, Mr. I can't remember his name right now. Major troll, major troll, and he came on logical, plausible, probable channel. He's been trolling me for a while. He talks a lot of a lot of trash, and uh, you know we went went out in a genetic entropy, and I silenced him. I silenced him with the primary source data. You're just making this up. Effectively neutral mutations, low impact, very slightly deleterious mutations. Nobody talks about this other than young Earth creationists. Oh, really? Under the present model, effectively neutral, but in fact. Very slightly deleterious mutants. Effectively neutral means very slightly deleterious mutants. And in the debate that I moderated two years ago between Paul Price of CMI at the time and Dr. Ron Garrett, who's written a lengthy blog attempting to refute uh, John Sanford on genetic entropy, during the cross exam, one of the cross exam rounds, Paul Price, a fantastic debater, <clears throat> asked Ron. A very basic question. What do these population geneticists mean by effectively neutral? And he did not know. Which pretty well concedes the debate right there. Because effectively neutral means very slightly deleterious mutants accumulate continuously in every species. The rate of loss of fitness per generation may amount to 10 to the 7 per generation, whether such a small rate of deterioration. And here's the thing. When you read a lot of these papers and you read these, these hypotheses like super beneficial mutations, adaptive mutations, guess what? They've never been systematically analyzed. There's never been any numerical simulations done to actually demonstrate, at least from their end. From our end, using Mendel's accountant, even your best beneficial mutations, these, these hypothetical super beneficial mutations, do not counterbalance the damage. Notice this. Um, I think I have this in a separate. Okay, here we go. Iyer Walker. It seems unlikely that any mutation is truly neutral in the sense that it is no effect on fitness. All mutations must have some effect, even if that effect is vanishingly small. However, there is a class of mutations that we can term what? Effectively neutral. Effectively neutral. And uh, here's paper after paper demonstrating um, the reality of genetic degeneration, including these uh, 
um, numerical simulations that have validated this this reality and have pretty much just falsified uh, falsified evolutionary theory. Now, this does bring something to mind. And um, that is the fact that I've got a number of um, papers in my thousand slides that go over uh, the, these populations in the past. For example, uh, you know, mammoths uh, had a very high genetic load. Today, we have some isolated butterfly populations. The so-called uh, human fossil record, human evolutionary fossil record, these hominids, actually turns out that they were uh, genetically compromised. Neanderthals, Erectus, Naledi, uh, Luzonensis, Floresiensis, which many may know as the hobbit, they uh, were subject to reductive evolution. They were highly inbred. They were isolated. They were in less than ideal environmental conditions and uh, mutations rapidly accumulated and a lot of mutations that were in uh, hidden recessive form came to the forefront which led to rapid genetic degeneration now what's funny about that is is when i bring up those arguments okay um your dodgeball dan's of the world specifically dan stern cardinal he <clears throat> he likes to say and i notice a lot of people are repeating him on this so i'm going to just kind of demolish it again here he likes to say that um, muta in, uh, mutational meltdown that we see in these isolated populations, um, he likes to say that that is the opposite of what genetic entropy is, as in that doesn't provide us evidence for genetic entropy. And he'll point out that essentially mutations add genetic diversity because mutations are adding something that was not previously there. Okay, and of course that that is true, and um, this is also to go back to good old Sam Burns here, who tried to use his analogy <clears throat> about how uh, mutations can lead to uh, diversity that that's beneficial. No, that's not true. That's what we're going to demolish here. So he'll say inbreeding uh, increases levels of homozygosity, right, and decreases levels of heterozygosity. So you, you lose genetic diversity in, in these populations that are isolated and inbred. And this is where Dan misses the point. Okay, because he's trying to say true genetic entropy would be mutation accumulation and so more and more levels of genetic diversity. But what we're seeing in uh, cases of uh, mutational meltdown, it's actually lower levels of genetic diversity as a result of inbreeding, isolation, founder effects, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> what he doesn't realize and what Sam Burns doesn't realize is that inbreeding is a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species, okay? And the vast majority of mutations, as we've demonstrated here through uh, the primary scientific literature, are slightly deleterious, they're effectively neutral, and um, what we call genetic diversity in terms of what mutations add per generation, okay, this so-called beneficial quote-unquote genetic diversity being built up by deleterious mutation accumulation is simply, sorry to break it to you, Sam and Dodgeball Dan, this is simply diversity in the sense of an ever-accumulating amount of random deleterious mutations. This is not beneficial diversity. This is the type of diversity that you get in terms of the scratches, the dings, the dents, and the rust marks on your car. This is not going to help counterbalance, <laughs> okay, the massive numbers of low impact uh, deleterious mutations that are pouring into the generations of living organisms uh, every generation. And these mutations aren't going to counterbalance the what? The loss in total biological functionality. Okay. And yes, Dan, most mutations are recessive. This means that once they become homozygous at specific sites or loci, degeneration happens even faster as a population is now getting closer and closer to what? Mutational meltdown.
Okay, these mutations that have been building up, for example, in the human population, every single human is multiply mutant. And so the more time that goes on, the more likely that you're going to have these recessive mutations that are in hidden form be manifest. Okay, because that's what happens. These recessive deleterious mutations are manifested and then they lead to disease. They lead to more and more genetic degeneration. And so, again, inbreeding is like a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species. And that is because inbreeding speeds this up. It speeds up the genetic entropy problem. It's kind of like microgenetic entropy versus macrogenetic entropy, right? The evolutionists like to look to microevolution and they like to look to macroevolution, okay, which... Large scale evolution is obviously false and uh, pretty well impossible for many reasons that we're not going to have time to get into today. But inbreeding is that type of genetic entropy that's on the micro level. Okay. Because inbreeding is speeding up the greater genetic entropy problem that larger populations are heading towards. And as humans accumulate more deleterious mutations, more deleterious mutations can now be manifested that were once in recessive form. And so genetic diversity from random deleterious mutations is not beneficial diversity. It is negative diversity. And that's why the design diversity model, which I talked about in great detail in episode one of our new podcast series where I dealt with recombination rates, is the better explanation because the beneficial diversity that can be utilized for truly adaptive episodes has to be that type of beneficial diversity that was front loaded by God at creation that are not due to deleterious mutation accumulation. It is the evolutionist that believes, that proposes that all or almost all genetic variation and DNA differences within species across species is the result of mutations over time. Deleterious mutations over time. No, that doesn't lead to beneficial diversity. That actually leads to negative diversity. That actually leads to the extinction and the sickness of species. Guys, let's take 20,000 computer programs, okay? That let's say, analogous to the human mutation rate, accumulate 100 random errors every generation, okay? 20,000 computer programs, they accumulate 100 random errors every generation. And let's say after every program updates, well, the computer code, okay, after every update is accumulating 100 new errors in the same way that we accumulate 100 new mutations per person every single generation. The computer code may be becoming more diverse, right? May be becoming more diverse due to the random accumulation of errors, but Dr. Dan, I hope you're listening. It won't be long before the programs stop working. This is not evidence of things moving forward. It is evidence of things going downhill. Okay? Take 100 books. Take 100 books that are continuously experiencing typographical errors because mutations are essentially akin to typographical errors in a text. Random changes in the nucleotide sequence of DNA, okay? So we've got 100 books and uh, let's say 100 new um, typographical errors every single generation. Well, as time goes on, these 100 hypothetical books have accumulated typographical errors in all kinds of different locations. I mean, this is one very diverse population of books. But guess what? As the letters are scrambled more and more and more over time, the book will eventually reach a point where the sentences and the paragraphs and the chapters that the sentences and, and paragraphs are contained in are no longer understandable. The books have descended into complete gibberish. They are unreadable. Okay, that's what we're seeing today is isolated inbred populations that are a sneak preview into where larger populations are heading towards, okay? Now, we have removed a lot of selection in the human population as we do take care of our sickness, our sick, 
And if we get certain diseases, we do have medical advancements that can allow us to thrive, essentially, with diseases that otherwise we may die and not be able to reproduce. Okay, And in the wild, there is more selection. But as we have shown, even with intense selection, all you can ever do is slow down the degeneration process. It's like taking two steps up a mountain but then 10 steps backwards, you're never gonna climb that mountain, okay? And so a lot of animals in the wild, although we know that the mutation rate is pretty well high in, in all mammals at least. And although there, there's, there's stronger selection in the wild, okay? Because the animals are not necessarily taking care of their sick and the other factors we, we spoke on as well. Although the hu human popular humans have always gone to war and, and kind of killed each other. So, you know, there is a bit of a, of a counterbalance there. But nonetheless, we know, according to numerical simulations, of course, thousands of them, that selection can only ever slow down the process. So humans, based on the fact that selection has, has been removed and selection is, is much stronger in um, animal populations, now, it's better to say that selection in, in humans has been relaxed, not completely removed. So we would expect animals may um, degenerate slower while humans, we can see that uh, mutation-related diseases are on the rise. Cancers are skyrocketing, immunological diseases, autoimmune diseases. Um, autism clearly has a, a genetic component to it. And... Um, so in the wild, even with a little bit uh, stronger selection, you're still going to degenerate. And we used that example earlier that you can remove the best of the best and you are still left with a population of individuals that are more mute, mutant than the generation before it. Okay, so no, there is no solutions. Sam, step in the ring. If this is the best you got, I mean, I don't think he... Yeah, he, look at this. He didn't, he didn't address anything. This is precisely why I don't really engage the keyboard Karens, because when you do, they dodge. Otherwise, in a debate, they can't dodge. OK, he's repeating talking points and um, clearly did not understand the fact that uh, the PRDM9, as it applies to. So here's the thing, according to the biblical creation model, OK, because he says that only explains why some groups have more diversity than others. It still doesn't explain how such diversity was passed down from the original Eden pair. So at creation, you'd have the most heterozygous kinds of creatures because this is creation, no mutations and the most heterozygosity. And I've talked about frequently on this channel how we can tell what is design diversity, what is a created allele, let's say, and what may be due to mutations based on allele frequencies. If it's common, it's not disease causing, it's functional, it's probably designed and created because it's not negative diversity we're looking at. But if it's rare, if it leads to disease, then we can usually uh, safely say that we're dealing with, with a mutation here. But what the an important point to consider that I don't think Sam is considering, but I discussed this in the video he's critiquing, is the fact that the one generation bottleneck at the flood was followed by rapid and exponential population growth. Okay. So the animals that would have had a significant amount of heterozygosity, very little of that heterozygosity would have been lost because it was followed by rapid and exponential population growth. Okay, so still not as diverse as in the creation event, but you still have more fully operational PRDM9 sites. More fully operational PRDM9 sites that have not been degraded due to mutations, more hotspots means that population can harbor more genetic diversity, more little snips of DNA. This should not be that difficult to understand. But I notice a lot of these keyboard warriors want to uh, argue just to argue. This one's funny here. So Matt. Um, on our secondary channel, Young Earth Creation, he um, he was responding to a group of comments that came in from these keyboard warriors that were talking about, there's just no evidence for the front loading of DNA. And in one comment, there's so many comments here, I can't seem to find it, um, unless it's in this one, let's see. 
No, I can't find it. So I think it was Sam Burns again. Um, he was trying to say that there's no evidence for front loading of, of DNA, even though we've literally talked over and over again about how um, functional the, the, the genome in it is in a direct prediction of the created heterozygosity model, okay, is DNA function. We would predict that the majority of the genome and these DNA sequences, these DNA elements like endogenous retroviruses, these other classes of retrotransposons, um, ALU sequences, pseudogenes, that which the evolutionist looks to as genomic fossils, evolutionary leftovers and junk, we would predict are functional. And uh, the function would also correlate with the nested hierarchical patterns in the sense that we are looking at nested hierarchies by design and not descent. Okay, we've made a number of, of very technical predictions that I'm not going to get into right now, including in my new book on endogenous retroviruses. I do make some testable predictions pertaining to the hierarchical distribution of these mutations, so-called mutations. Um, I think uh, people will be... Uh, I enjoy the, the response that, that I give to these so-called so mutations in the properties or the structure of these herb sequences, like the LTR, uh, the LTRs on either side, uh, long terminal repeats, the gag, the fold, the NV gene. Um, but nonetheless, there's been very specific predictions that flow from the front loading of DNA hypothesis, the design diversity hypothesis, that, by the way, evolutionists, the evolutionary community has not matched those predictions. And these predictions are proving to be true more and more and more. I talked about the human, um, the epigenome, that extra layer of complicated information. This, if every single gene was turned on at the same time, that would not be good. That would be disease. That would be, that would not be good. And so we have this control system that can help determine when a gene is turned on, when a gene is turned off. And we know, we see in the primary source data that we have what's called rapid evolution. Okay, the evolutionists were caught off surprise that organisms can adapt rapidly simply by entering a new environment because they have the pre-existing capability of that rapid change. And this is evidence for a forward thinker because these are forward thinking mechanisms within the genome. We know there are countless classes of redundant elements. Okay, redundancy, we understand, is a good design. And uh, Sam Burns tried to point out uh, it's just funny because Matt has this massive comment here and Sam Burns being the little keyboard warrior that he is, he says, if we find, so Sam doesn't even address anything, just like he, right? He just, just ignores it all over his head, doesn't address anything. And um, just kind of, it's a red herring, just tries to uh, bring up something new, right? Uh, he answered this, so what about this kind of thing? And then the very question that he asked, for example, if we find gene, genes or alleles in dogs, which aren't found in wolves, would that falsify your hypothesis? We also know that a lot of genetic information is in, in latent form, okay? And when this latent information that's in hidden form is manifested, okay, let's say a, a, rec a recessive created uh, allele is manifested that can lead to phenotypic adaptation or change, not anatomical, morphological uh, adaptability, based on the pre-existing ability to do so with these uh, design variants that are in recessive form. Okay, we have paper after paper confirming that, uh, you know, this is, is certainly the case. And um, people, these, these critics like Sam Burns, they don't understand the fact that when we're talking about created uh, heterozygosity, okay, think back to basic genetics, capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. You're genetically heterozygous. Capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, you're genetically homozygous. So if you're capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b, at millions of sites within the genome, then you pretty much have unlimited potential for adaptation, for diversity. If all of this genetic diversity, these DNA differences are already built into creatures at creation, it doesn't take a lot of time for, for change. It doesn't take a lot of time for phenotypic change. All right. All it takes is recombination. All it takes is um, a few generations and you can have uh, rapid change. And again, a direct prediction of that is what? Is the prediction on DNA function. And I could spend hours going over 
the evidence for genome-wide functionality that we have. Pa paper after paper. And you know what? The, the chapter that I deal with uh, this specific argument on in um, the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook leaves no stone unturned. Okay, we have evidence that the vast majority of the genome, roughly 80% is active. We can make predictions as creationists based on that activity because creationists expect treasure, not junk. It's the evolutionist that expects junk, and that's why they constantly have egg on their face because we know the junk DNA paradigm has been overturned. They never predicted function for endogenous retroviruses and a lot of these so-called genomic or viral fossils. But the, what they will say, and um, I had a two-part series with Dr. Fuzrana where we addressed all the critics' arguments in terms of junk DNA, those that want to save the junk DNA paradigm, specifically the arguments from Dan Stern Cardinal, now because he put out some videos uh, pertaining to that topic, hoping to uh, deceive his audience into thinking that the majority of the genome still is junk. And we just dismantle all those arguments. And the silence is a very telling from the critics themselves. But they'll try and say that the vast majority of this activity that is taking place is basically, um, they'll say spurious, or they'll say it's basically just noise, biological noise. And um, what's interesting, though, about that is the fact that I touch on this in great detail in, in my upcoming book. So just in a nutshell, uh, we understand that to transcribe a portion of the genome is very energy intensive. Okay, it takes a lot of energy to transcribe a portion of, of the genome. And every time that we add a nucleotide to a growing RNA chain, a large amount of energy is actually being consumed to do this. That is a significant amount of energy being released as heat to essentially do, no, do nothing for no purpose at all, to just create transcripts that apparently are not utilized for any real reason. Here's the thing. These transcripts would actually clutter up the interior of the cell if they are not really playing a functional role. And here's the thing. If most of this activity really was just junk, well, that's wasteful of energy um, and resources for the cell that over time, you'd think that selection would remove all of this junk, okay? It would just remove all of this junk. If we just had a bunch of tires and junk in the backseat of our, our car or the trunk that's just cluttering it up, I mean, eventually we're probably just going to toss it out and say, we don't really need this, okay? And... Um, that tells us that this activity is here for a reason. And then they'll even say like, well, it's just easier to transcribe it. This activity is just easier than, than to just uh, get rid of it or, or even not transcribe it if we're specifically focusing on, on transcription. That's ridiculous. There are mechanisms within the genome that can suppress that, can suppress that activity if it's just spurious or noise. So you have selection that should be removing all of this junk. You have mechanisms in the genome that should be suppressing essentially this junk rather than making it active for no reason. If it's just noise, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it's, just, it's not just one or two functions that we're finding in all of these various classes of functional DNA elements. No, it's function after function after function. And you're going to see in my endogenous retrovirus handbook, you are going to see and you are going to be surprised just how badly the junk DNA argument fails. And here's the thing. When you can demonstrate that the vast majority of the genome is functional, okay, it not only overturns evolutionary theory because now there's no way for animals to progress in terms of phenotypic complexity, novel body plans, forward evolution. Because if the majority of the genome is functional and yet we're accumulating roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation with, with most of them being effectively neutral, but yet, even if the genome's 10% functional, species degenerate. Can you imagine 80% functional? And not only that, if the majority of the genome and these genetic markers and these so-called junk sequences that they like to use on their phylogenetic uh, trees and in phylogenetic systematics to show these, these hierarchical distributions, essentially in pseudogenes, endogenous retroviral sequences, this actually demonstrates that these hierarchies are there by design rather than descent. You overturn the junk DNA paradigm, evolutionary theory dies, okay? Because within 
that that greater circle that you can call junk DNA. You have pseudogenes, you have nested hierarchies, phylogenetic systematics, ALU sequences, ERVs. You have all of these things that with the overturning of junk DNA overturns all of these things as well. So that being said, um, we are pretty much coming on an hour. And so what I want to do is keep these about an hour. And, uh, you know, what I'm going to do probably about once a week or whenever I have time, I am going to uh, pick out one or two comments and we are just going to uh, demonstrate to the world exactly why these individuals, these evolutionists have chosen proudly, have chosen proudly to be full time keyboard Karens, keyboard ninjas. And what I want to do, guys, is suggest maybe in the uh, comment section, uh, let's see who, who can put forth the most creative name for these guys, keyboard warriors, keyboard ninjas, keyboard Karens, whatever. And, uh, you know, let's get some really creative and, and interesting titles for, for these guys. So <laughs> that being said, thank you so much for tuning in. We just hit the hour mark. Uh, please check out the first two episodes in our new Standing for Truth podcast series. We've touched on recombination rates, and we also just touched on um, copper creation and the flood. And we will see you for our debate between uh, Dr. Dino and Ian Chen. God bless everybody. Mm -hmm.